Uh, good morning. Um, thank you very much for asking me to come and uh, talk to you about uh, warranties. Um, the timing really couldn't be, be be better because uh, the position under English law changed radically two weeks ago uh, with the implementation of the Insurance Act 2015. We'll go through that uh, later on. It's, uh, it's a, a really huge radical change uh, under English law which is particularly important to marine insurers to non-marine insurers as well, but we'll look specifically at the implications for marine insurers, whether they be yachts, all different sizes, or ships. Um, uh, as Mike said, I'm responsible for Charles Taylor's uh, yacht practice around the world. We have 66 offices around the world. Not all of them do yachts, but the predictable places such as Piraeus, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, do a lot of yacht work and I'm responsible uh, for that. Uh, our work is primarily for insurers. Uh, we have delegated authority on behalf of a number of the Lloyd syndicates and uh, we have um, various contracts covering specialist crafts such as round the world cruises uh, and round the world races. We do Volvo, we do Zippa, um, all the big ones basically. And uh, a very strong team here in London. We have uh, about another 12 teams around the world. So, commonly breached warranties for small craft and their implications for insurers and insureds. Uh, it's quite a mouthful. Uh, it can be quite a dry topic. We're going to try and spice it up a little bit. Uh, for those of you who may have read the article I wrote for your uh, newsletter last year, I found out that uh, Elvis Presley released Don't Be Cruel on the same, same day 60 years previously to the new Insurance Act coming out. Um, we're not going to get the King to sing to us this morning, but um, you'll see later on why that was so uh, so apt and so important. So the first thing, obviously, when you're considering uh, warranties and their implications is what exactly is a warranty? Now, the best e definition I could find was in the Marine Insurance Act 1906. The new Insurance Act of 2015 does not repeal the 1906 Act. It's still intact, it's still there, it's still on the statute book. What the 2015 Act does is change the difference in interpretations, but the basic definition of a warranty is unchanged by the new law. Warranty is a condition which must be exactly complied with, whether it's material to the risk or not. If it's not so complied with, then subject to any express provision in the policy, i.e. one that changes it. So if you had, a, say, a trading warranty within the main body of the policy, but the boat moves at some point during the policy period, and the insurers are informed, they agree it, and they issue endorsement, then of course the basic insurance policy has been radically changed. So the, the insurer is discharged from liability as from the date of the breach. Now this is where we start getting quite draconian because as you can read for yourselves, as soon as you've got a breach of warranty, the underwriters are off risk. Doesn't matter if you remedy the breach later on, doesn't matter if you're only out for a couple of minutes, your policy stops. And if you have a claim, they're not going to pay it because the policy has stopped. So you can see that it's pretty severe. There doesn't have to be, any, under the Marine Insurance Act, there doesn't have to be any link between the casualty and the claim and the breach of warranty. As soon as you breach the warranty, your underwriters are effectively off risk. This little fella down here has got nothing to do with warranties. I just thought as surveyors you'd be quite interested in seeing it. That thing over there is, was described and listed as, as a houseboat. As you see, it, it's probably been modelled on a skip with a kind of a lid on it. Uh, I can see the thing leaked like a sieve. They were asking £850 for it and somebody bought it. One would assume that they didn't have it surveyed. So there are excusable uh, reasons for breaching a warranty. Uh, it's, you've probably seen there's a hurricane barreling across the Atlantic at the moment. It's got sustained winds of somewhere between 90 and 105 miles an hour. Now, if, if your boat is on restricted conditions and you've got a Category 3, 4 or 5 hurricane barreling towards you and you know you can get out of its way, but your policy is limited in terms of the navigational area, you're not, the, your underwriters are not going to criticise you for moving outside of your trading warranties if it means that you're getting the boat out of harm's way. There's also a lot of case law in terms of other navigational um, issues which normally relate to wartime. And if uh, war is declared between two states and your yacht or your ship is in the uh, enemy waters, you have to get it out, whatever the policy says in terms of navigational limit. And there's, there's several cases uh, that relate to that going back to the First and the Second World War, or principally the First World War. 
So some breaches are excusable. So non-compliance with a warranty is excused when by reason of a change of circumstances, such as the outbreak of war, such as a huge hurricane coming towards you, the warranty ceases to be applicable to the circumstances of the contract or when compliance with the warranty is rendered unlawful by any subsequent law. So again, in the case of law, if it's un unlawful to be in the enemy's waters you, you, uh, and the boat gets stuck there, then that's excusable, but you have to do your best to try and get it out. Now, there are two types of warranty according to the Marine Insurance Act. And again, I must stress to you, the Insurance Act is radical, but it doesn't replace this. The definition of warranties and the two definition, the specific definitions of warranties remain in force, completely unchanged. So you have implied warranties, which according to the Marine Insurance Act are seaworthiness and legality, and then you have express warranties. Now as I've, I've said there, the legality, which sometimes uh, I've had two or three of them in the last five years where the, the voyage has been unlawful. I also had one where the assured wisely withdrew his claim because I knew that he was human trafficking. He knew that I knew he was human trafficking and he happened to be human trafficking at the time that, uh, that he had his loss. Of course, as soon as he started doing it, the underwriters would have been off risk anyway. As you saw earlier, breach is absolute. Breach it, we're off. So the legality sometimes comes up. That can be things like trading in enemy waters, human trafficking, smuggling, um, those are probably the three most common. There's case law on one case, well, going back 60 years, I think it was, reasonably sized yacht, and they were running contraband in it. Uh, had a fire, which was completely accidental. The, the cause of the loss, perfectly fine. Electrical fault, boat goes up, as they do. But because it had been found that two of the people on board had convictions for running contraband, and there was contraband on the boat at the time, then the underwriters were off risk. They went to court here, and the underwriters won. Express warranties are obvious, they're not the ones that are implied, they're actually written into the policy. So, here's some examples of some of them. That's, um, that's a, I think it was a 90 foot sunseeker that caught fire in, uh, in Sutter Grande and, and sank. I don't know if you can see the guy in the water there holding his hand up. Um, one wit who saw this photograph said, he's, where's my beer? Um, but there was nothing to do with breach warranty in that, I just think it's a good photograph. So, there are a number of express warranties that you find in uh, insurance policies. Uh, basis of contract warranties, uh, that means that whatever has been told to the underwriters uh, at the time of placing the risk or underwriting the risk becomes a warranty in the policy. So if you tell me your boat's 1989 and it turns out to be 1987, and that makes part of the contract and so the underwriters, that's probably an extreme example, but the, it gives the underwriters a basis to avoid coverage under the policy. Class and class maintained, probably not at the smaller boat end of things, which is what we're talking about this morning, but certainly in the, the super mega and giga yachts, it's quite common to see a, a class warranty. And the underwriters take great, great, great interest in class, particularly if it's a, a builder that's new on the scene or it's a, a builder that they don't know about. They're going to be particularly interested if it's one of the top five um, IX class societies. Compliance with survey recommendations, um, you guys write the reports, the underwriters obviously trust you and uh, if they, you come up with some findings that are pretty serious, chances are the underwriters are going to put a warranty in the policy to sell the insured that he must comply with your recommendations. It's normally a time period attached to it. Uh, where it that gets complicated is if there's a loss within the time period and um, it really depends on whether it's phrased as a warranty. Uh, or a condition precedent, which is a whole different uh, subject that we don't really want to get into this morning. But if it's a condition precedent, that means it has to be complied with, other, otherwise the underwriters are um, they're not at risk. And if it's a breach of warranty, as I've said to you several times this morning already, they're off risk as well. We haven't got time to go into the difference between the two, but um, that's another express warranty that's quite common. Uh, on, the, on the larger yachts, they also go to great lengths to, um, by they I mean the insurers, go to great lengths to put warranties in regarding compliance with all local laws, regulations, crewing requirements. They're quite often on the very large yachts, uh, they're more interested in the crew than they are in the yacht itself. And so there'll be a warranty specifying the captain or give them the choice of two captains. They, the underwriters will have seen their CVs or their resumes before agreeing to cover the captain 
Um, so as surveyors, it's probably useful to you to know that these things are in the insurance policies, but I'm guessing that probably you, when you get sent an instruction, you don't ever see this insurance policy, do you, or do you? Well, I guess it's, it's important for us when it involves MLC as well. Yes. That's very true. Um, and we do a lot of our, our city actually we always ask for a copy of the insurance policy. <laughs> all these different times we can get sometimes you can use the policy. Coverage is between the, the sort of below twenty four metres and above are markedly different, aren't they? Oh, and some of the policies I'm seeing coming out of the London market at the moment, you just think what more can you actually throw in there? Because we've got now well, we're now back to the days of nil deductibles. Loss of use for 250,000, sometimes 500,000. And these are on relatively small boats. I saw 250,000 loss of use, or substitute vessel, whichever we want to call it, cover, on a boat that was only insured for 2.5 million in the first place. Quarter of a million, and there was no additional premium for it. Now, if you're the owner, given the choice of running your boat at your expense for a couple of weeks with your family on it, or your insured's expense for absolutely nothing, which one are you going to go for? It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, is it? Yeah. So we've got nil deductibles, we've got loss of use, machinery damage on everything over 24 metres, unless it's ancient, is pretty much thrown in for nothing, all accidental uh, loss. Um, uh, and rates are 50% lower than they were five years ago. But are they paying out? Well, my lot do, yeah. We make sure they do. But, so. And those tenders, that, like the limousine ones that you're talking about, the very expensive ones, the deductible, if there is one, is 250 bucks. I mean, we might as well not bother, really. Um, and now we've, we've been working with a couple of the larger Lloyd syndicates over the last two, three years on putting together uh, real uh, package policies. So we're covering the fine art, we're covering the helicopters, uh, cars, if there are any, um, high-level personal accident, all on the same policy. Um, just to try and get enough premium into one policy so that when inevit the inevitable happens. I mean, Aviva is still the largest yacht loss at the moment, which was in 2001, and that was 80 million US. It was less than that because we got money back from third parties. If you think about the values of Topaz, which is insured for 1.3 billion euros, then you've got the ZAM, which is 800. Um, I don't know what Clips is currently insured for, but it'd be about the same. 80, mil 80 million is nothing compared with something going wrong on the one of those. We're going slightly off piece, but you're, you're, look, you're looking interested, so I'll tell you this as well. The other thing that we're looking at very carefully at the moment, and it's a massive project, but the underwriters keep asking it, and there is no answer, is cyber. Because you will, will have seen, I think it was about four or five years ago, that the University of Miami took over a super yacht. Now, the thought of somebody, and I'm, I've got a demonstration from a guy who apparently hacked the FBI when he was 15 next week. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but anyway, he's actually going to do this demonstration as part of our study. We're a friendly super yacht, he's going to take it over, and we're going to sit there and watch him. Now, if you're the, the captain of one of these things, then you know that, that what your instruments are telling you is completely reverse of what's going on. Just that the, the whole thing is too horrible to think about. I say the only reason that we're involved with it is because the underwriters want to try and evaluate the scale of the risk. I mean, pick a number. Somebody takes control of one of those when it's Monaco Yacht Show, you know how many boats are out there at anchor. It really is frightening stuff. And it's relatively easily done. And also through, I didn't know there was such a thing as a smart fridge, but apparently there is, so you can, you can control its temperature from your iPhone, your iPad or whatever. That can be used as a tool for taking over something like a yacht, or at the very least, you know, sending out ransom, not ransom demands, but demands for money. Um, and that, if that's your fridge, at, according to the lawyers that were telling me about this, you can be held responsible for not taking enough precautions to stop your fridge intimidating somebody or taking over their yacht. The world has gone mad. The more we look at this, the more you realise that this is just unquantifiable and unstoppable. So anyway, so, so you're looking interested, so I thought we'd just go a little bit. It's, it's more interesting than, than warranties, really. 
Um, so those are, the, those are a number of the express ones. How are we doing for time? Um, now these are two, what, two that are quite common as well. Um, Manning requirements. So the, in both of these cases, the Resolute, and that is the Newfoundland Explorer, it's an old Canadian fishing, uh, fishing boat that was quite badly actually converted into a super yacht. Lots of volumes, but it, like the guy had just gone to B&Q and just it really, really, it wasn't super yacht standard, but it was super yacht length. Caught fire in Fort, Fort Lauderdale, it's Port Everglades behind there. It was, it was during Fleet Week, so there's a thousand tourists, and it was right at the beginning of Fleet Week, so there was nothing else to do but turn up and get in my way while this is, while this is on fire. Um, the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department, it wasn't the Port Fire Department that dealt with it, it was the on land one. So their idea was, well, if we sink it, then we'll put the fire out. But she's got, a, I think it was a 13-foot draft, and the water's only about you know, 20 feet deep, so it was, ne it was never going to work. But anyway, that's what they were trying to do. The Resolute was a small fishing boat, that had, uh, so had no accommodation on it at all. It just got the wheelhouse, it got a little bit of a mess, uh, and the rest of it was just as you would expect on a fishing boat. The underwriters warranted, warranted that that boat should be manned at all times. Well, you can't because there's nowhere to sleep, but the underwriters turned, declined the claim on that basis. The owners took them to court and they won. The difference on the Newfoundland Explorer is that it had exactly the same warranty in it, it's got, as you can see, huge amounts of accommodation. Um, it's fully kitted out, not well, but it's fully kitted out. You could live on it. Now, ironically, when that caught fire, the captain, who was the only crew member, was 16 miles away having a barbecue in his back garden while the boat's having its own little barbecue. So I took the guys... I, I knew him, actually, because he, he hired one of, my, he took one of my old offices. And um, I took his examination under oath, his statement, and uh, he went to great lengths almost to tell me to the burger what he'd been having in his garden on the Sunday afternoon at this court fire. So the underwriters declined it on the basis of breach of warranty and they won. Um, these are the common ones that you, you will all have come across, I'm sure. Um, private pleasure only. Ag again, although on some of these big yachts over 24 metres, they're supposed to be private pleasure, a number of the underwriters will cover them for 12 weeks of chartering, which is quite a lot, really. I mean, if you get 12 weeks of chartering here, you're doing, you're doing pretty well. They'll cover that, again, at no premium. Um, and there is a, a definite increased risk when you've got charters on board, obviously, because the crew are getting tired and your personal injury uh, exposure goes through the, roof as, through the roof as well. Maximum design speed. Um, of some of these, uh, the faster bones, particularly with the, uh, with the, the Arneson drives, um, the underwriters are particularly keen on that. I drove a 70-footer in the Caribbean because it was, uh, a guy had died falling off it um, and I had to try and you know, sort of reenact the, the incident, preferably without the same result, obviously. And this thing is 70 foot long and it does 100 knots. And I took it, I took it up to 60 and I thought, this is just terrifying. You can't see anything. If there's anything in the water and you're going that fast, my reactions are pretty good, but if something's in the water and you're doing that kind of speed, you've got no hope of stopping. So um, that one actually hadn't got a speed warranty in it, and I don't think the underwriters really knew what they were writing when they insured it. And in fact, I'm certain that because I know the guy and he's very, very conservative, and underwriting boats that go that speed is anything but conservative. Uh, this is one that I wanted to, to just to bring to your attention because this is... Um, this is quite an important topic at the moment. About 10 years ago, particularly in Florida, when uh, super yacht yards started closing down and getting turned into condominiums, the yards that were remaining realised that they got pretty strong arms to be able to um, change contracts for refits and repairs very much in their favour. I've got one at the moment which the underwriters didn't know about. The boat was insured for 20 million US dollars. You turn the repair contract over and there's a huge amount of exculpatory or limiting language on the back, and then you get to their limit of liability, if you could indeed get to it, $25,000 on a 20 million value. And it would have been the same if it had been a 200 million value. $25,000 is all you get. So in, we, when we lost a big one in, uh, I think it was 2009, big, and it was 10 million. And so uh, we... Uh, got together with a lawyer, some brokers and underwriters, and we came up with this thing called the refit and repair clause. And basically it says that if you're going to go in for any hot work, any major work other than just basically having the bottom painted, you have to tell the underwriters, otherwise the underwriters are off risk. 
And the $20 million one that I told you about um, is exactly what happened. The boat had had a relatively minor incident. Um, she's still hull. She was going to have to go into the yard uh, for welding. There's a $300,000 deductible and in which it was the, the repairs were going to be below that. But the point was she was going in to have welding done and grinding and all other hot work. So they should have told the underwriters and it caught fire and it's a total loss. All because of that. So if you see a, a particularly a, a steel or, or aluminium hull boat and it's, it's in for repair, just ask the owner if he's told the underwriters because if it catches fire, it's too late. I had one in, um, where was it? Somewhere in Italy. I can't remember now. About, uh, about two months ago. And uh, she was out aluminium. She'd uh, had, a, had a grounding. The captain kept apologising to me, saying, I'm so sorry I've had a claim. I'm so sorry I've had a claim. I said, well, that's what you bought the insurance policy for. But I've never had one quite so apologetic. Anyway, they were doing some grinding on this. They hadn't told the underwriters what they were going to be doing, so I did. And the, the fire protection, well, it was non-existent. There was, one, there was one main, which was at the other side of the yard, not connected to anything. In fact, I'm not even sure it was connected to water. Um, and the sparks flying out of this thing. They've got the, 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 stabilizer, the old stabiliser sitting next to the boat. And as you know, there's foam inside when you take the plastic, the, the GRP off it, and uh, that's what happened. The sparks flying out of this thing at 400 degrees or whatever those little pellets are, landing straight on the top of this fiberglass. And I'm standing there, no, 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 and they're pretending they don't understand what that means, which I find, whether you speak Italian or not, most people know that's not good. And uh, so they went away and got a tarpaulin and put that over it, which was even more flammable than the... Honestly, some people. Um, so... <laughs> And in the end, because the underwriters wouldn't agree to it, he went through the repair period effectively uninsured for 17 and a half million euros. And that's with me saying... So in the end, because the, I'm trying to stop the yard from doing this, the yard sends out their interpreter, who happens to be quite young, very attractive and very friendly. And she insisted on putting my telephone number into her telephone and vice versa. And then I was asked what I was doing that evening. I, it's, no, if you think this is going to get you away from the fact that you're about to set fire to my boat, you can forget it. It wasn't exactly subtle. Um, so, yeah, w when you're doing surveys and you can see that it's going to be hot work, particularly if it's a boat over 24 metres, then just, uh, have you, you sure you told them? Because it'd be a major problem otherwise. The legality one, uh, for, I think that speaks for itself. And the underwriters can't waive it because if it's illegal, then the underwriters are going to be as guilty as sin as the assured. So um, that's the only warranty they, they cannot waive. Uh, the seaworthiness one, we'll just quickly do this because we want to get on to the new act. Um, this is really, really difficult. Basically, under English law, if the vessel is unseaworthy with the owner's knowledge and the, the boat sinks as a result of that unseaworthiness, the underwriters are off. Trying to get behind the corporate veil of some of these offshore companies to find out exactly who the owner is, is a devil of a job, if you can actually achieve it. You've also got how far up in the owning company do you go to say, right, they, that owner has got the privity, not so much on the yachting side, but if you're dealing with a major, an oil major that may have 10,000 employees, who is the assured? Who is it that has to have privity? It's not as straightforward as, as it looks. Very, very few cases have ever, ever run on it because it is so complicated. There have been some, but uh, they normally run in conjunction with other, other issues. Now then, here we are. This is the new bit. The Insurance Act 2015 came into effect just over two weeks ago, and it radically changes everything that I've told you so far this morning. Um, basis of contract clauses are abolished. Uh, the breach of warranty has a suspensory effect on coverage rather than being the old draconian way of you breach your warranty, you're out. So if, for example, you've got uh, navigation limits which are, say, 6 or 12 miles offshore and you decide to go 15, the underwriters are off risk while you're out in 15, but they come back on again when you come back into the 12. So it's considered to be much fairer. Whether the underwriters feel that way or not, I somewhat doubt it. As I said to you earlier, they've already got 50% less income than they had this time five years ago, 
we now got in a situation where you can't rely on things that they've relied on for their in entire working lives. So it's a that's one of the major changes. There are other changes as well relating to disclosure and fraudulent claims, but they're not the subject to this topic this morning. The, uh, the important thing to think about here is that under English law now, uh, the breach of warranty has a suspensory effect. Without wanting to get too much into the really dry stuff of policy wordings, if, you, if you're working on a boat that's insured un under the Institute Yacht Clauses, or if you're working on a ship that's got in the Institute Hull Clauses, right at the top it says this policy is subject to English law and jurisdiction. Which means it doesn't matter that you may be dealing with a Panamanian owner, you may be dealing with somebody in the BVIs. Uh, America would be different because they'd make sure that the dispute was heard over there. But this is a much further and far-reaching effect because of the extensive use of English law and jurisdiction. So just because the boat is insured you know, in France, the, the French still love the Institute Yacht Clauses. I don't know why, they're, they're an absolute abomination. I mean, I think every, every copy of them should be taken out and you know, shredded. They're just dreadful. But just because you're dealing with something abroad doesn't necessarily mean that this act isn't going to apply. It, re it really is a massive change. So the implications for the insurer um, are that what the tools that they've been using for risk management in the past, such as warranties, has now been radically changed for them so that they can't rely on the things they always have done in the past, uh, or certainly not to, to such an extent. Um, it probably also means that for borderline risks where in the past they'd have put a worry, warranty on to deal with whatever it is they're worried about. For example, we had a case, uh, it was a, a large wooden boat, ended up on the rocks in Cuba. Um, it, 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 that was unfortunate. I mean, it wasn't covered to be in Cuba, but it had engine failure and it drifted onto the rocks. Okay, fair enough. But at the time that uh, the risk was presented to the underwriters, the underwriter looked at it and he thought, I have never heard of these, this type of boat before. And he called me up and I'd never heard of it. And the reason was it was a one-off. But the broker told him that it had been built to GL standards. So he warranted it GL class and class maintained. No classification society had ever heard of this boat. Not even one of the ones that perhaps we don't have quite such a high view of. But certainly to manager Lloyd never had. The Assures explanation was, well, it's got a CE mark on it. That's the same thing. No. Not, not so much, really. Um, so they put the warranty in there, and the underwriters obviously, obviously um, declined it for, for the breach of the warranty. The, the insured is definitely coming off best out of this, because he, as long as he's prepared to be his own insurer for the time when he's outside of his warranties, then you know, the policy doesn't stop. It just carries on once he comes back in. So I think they're, they're doing quite well. So they've effectively got considerably broader coverage at an ever-decreasing price, and now don't have to worry so much about, well, frankly, telling lies when they take the insurance policy out in the first place, and also for warrant warranties too. Um, so it's very much consumer-driven, and uh, that's, uh, that's indeed what's happened. Um, there is one more little bit that I need to tell you about, which is the Enterprise Act 2016, which comes into effect next year, 2017, um, and what that is going to allow is, it was primarily, as you probably know, it's, it's primarily designed for small businesses. So it gives the small business owner more rights to chase up delinquent payers. You can include interest by law. Again, you can contract out of it, but what will happen, particularly for consumers, is that um, you will be able to get interest on what could be deemed as late payment of claims. The difficulty we've got is that for all of our clients, um, they pay, pay claims very quickly. But what we're concerned about is that the investigation time, which could be completely bona fide, could in the end turn around to bite us if we end up paying interest on top. Now, as far as I know, we don't know what the percentage is. The Norwegians have been doing it this way for years. They automatically pay interest at about 7%, I think, on, on claims. Um, and it's just, just an accepted part of the Nordic plan. But it isn't the same in England and this could have real serious implications. For example, if we're looking at a breach of warranty, are we absolutely certain that the warranty was breached? Are we absolutely certain that the loss occurred 15 miles out, not 12 miles out? You know, we can look at the plotter, can't we, and see what the track says, but if the captain has accidentally deleted it, um, you're gonna be having to scrabble around, the yacht be too small to have AIS, so we can't use that. 
depending where you are, depends on how cooperative the Coast Guard's going to be to give any assistance. So while we're doing all of that investigation, which can take months, if we're wrong, then we're going to end up paying interest on top. Of course, if we're right, then we're not, we're not going to pay at all. Should you not remove the block from the vessel and have it forensically checked? Uh, we do, provided it, you know, it hasn't, um, hasn't gone walkabout. <laughs> No, there are certain parts of the world where you shouldn't be able to walk down the street without yeah. tripping over a plotter, really. But um, the, the, the Puerto Ricans are particularly good at getting them out quickly. Um, yes, we, yes, we do. But uh, yeah, that, that time that uh, we're investigating the loss could actually turn out to be quite expensive for us. No, that's, that's next year's problem. We'll deal with the Insurance Act first, one, thi one thing at a time. Oh, and then we've got the cyber terrorists as well. So, <laughs> yeah, it's busy times. So that's, that's really it. It's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour through it all. Uh, I hope you've got the, the flavour of just how different things are uh, today than they were a month ago um, if you brought a, brought a claim in England last year. And there were some going through the courts as the law was changing, but no, that's, that's the, way the, the way these things go. Yeah, Thank you very much. Lovely uh, presentation there. Uh, I have a doubt uh, on the part where you said that it's advisable that the owner uh, informs the owner right of what he is aware that is being done now. Um, we understand hot work and potential liability which is a bit of uh, scraping struggle. Uh, routinely vessels are pulled down for just cleaning the hull and they, of course there are straps going and the straps could be in the wrong place, there could be cracks etc. But would that also be required to be informed just in case you think uh, uh, probably not. If, you, if, if it's com coming out you know, just for new anodes, bottom paint, yeah. scrubbing, yeah. And it's yeah. 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 We, do, we do some pre-purchases and uh, I don't think any of the sellers actually inform them. No. Uh, there is a risk, of course, uh, by cheese up, they're not meant to be out of the trap, uh, of the airlifted of the trap, sort of paper. What happens when there is What, what they're really interested in, uh, having worked with them and putting these wordings together, what they're really interested in are two things. Long yard periods, because that materially changes the risk. If they've insured a, a yacht for 12 months, they assume that most of that time it's going to be afloat, probably in a marina, may have a professional captain on board. Putting it in a yard for 12 months is materially different, particularly regarding fire. Um, so they're concerned about you know, yachts being in the yard for the entire insurance period, which of course happens. Um, you can have you know, major refits that can last a year, two years, three years in, with Milani. Um, and the other one is the hot work. Yeah. Well, they've, they've had, uh, no pun intended, but they've had their fingers burnt too many times by yachts being, you know, catching fire in yards that haven't got adequate um, you know, fire protection. And they're also, they're also interested in which yard uh, and how much uh, liability insurance they've, they've, they've got as well. Yeah. Uh, one, other, one other doubt I have about change of ownership. The insurance policy is run out on one. The buyer is dilly-dallying and it's not yet signed the sale and purchase document. In the midst of this, there's a month of the policy running out. The seller doesn't want to renew it. Technically, it should be the, the seller that's, that's, that has it insured because you're going to get into all kinds of insurable interest issues for the buyer because he hasn't got any. Um, knowing how soft the market is at the moment, somebody would insure it for the seller. <laughs> somebody would, and no deductible, loss of charter use. Hey, I've got loss of use, I haven't got a boat at the moment. Oh, I have it anyway. 
No, it would be the management, management company that do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, or the captain, because the captain quite often has a, a big input into the insurance arrangements. <laughs> in Australia, at the moment, we're having a, a big regulatory change in the regulation of commercial vessels, domestic commercial vessels, so things are going to about 200 miles. The old days where we used to have manning committees that determined, the statutory manning committees that determined the crew complement or the vessel is gone. And now the owners do risk assessments and provide what they believe is the correct crew. You can really? Yeah. <laughs> Has somebody thought that's a good idea? It's a, yeah. <laughs> no, um, it's this hands-off regulatory approach. They run. Have you come across this in in, in, in insurance context? Because um, human nature being what it is, crew is a massive cost, and we're seeing um, some fairly self-serving crew determinations, self-crew determinations happening. And some fairly large boats with very, very small crews. So you, you, could you see that being an issue in the future? Uh, certainly on, uh, on the Mega and the Gigios, you know, the, the, the underwriters are more interested in the skipper than they, they are in the boat. This is probably the stuff that sits below the MLC level and stuff. Right. Um, the solar stuff. But, um, I haven't done so far. I mean, the it's pretty new. One of our clients did a study to find out how, how many losses ultimately can be put down to a human factor. And he, he, he a massive, I think he got up to about 90%, um, which has always been why he is one of the ones who, who's most interested in the crew rather, rather, rather than the yacht. Um, I haven't really seen any recently of what you'd call out and out incompetence. I've seen some silly ones, but I haven't, I haven't seen anything that would, that would suggest that they're just employing whoever walks along the dock first. We've got one ferry that was awaiting uh, transfer in Venezuela and the requirement was for a riding crew while she was sitting in harbour. And the owner basically decided to go to a local security company and hire a security guard to sit on there. And that, that was... That was it? Yeah, that was the solution. So some dude that... Yeah. Anyway. No, I can't... Oh. <laughs> No, I can't, uh, can't see it. When you say express warranty and uh, the crew competence and the skipper's qualification, etc., do matter. Uh, back in Dubai, we have marinas taking care of the skipper requirements. We've got three or four skippers hired by the marina, and uh, there are boats moored around, and they are actually signed up as a skipper. They actually yeah. are the payroll of the marina. Does that qualify as, as being? legitimately having a skipper. And of course, you have uh, able seamen to hire and all the boats want you to go out and things like that. And pay for yeah, I think it would depend on what the, the manning requirements and the crew warranties actually said, because there are a number of different versions of them. With um, the Newfoundland Explorer, it just said warranted crewed at all times, because there was only one there as well, it couldn't physically be done because the guy was going to have to come off and get food and you know, go and see his families. But that wasn't the underwriter's problem. And they could have hired more people. There's more than enough accommodation on there. For the, you know, with Master Suites, the, the owner was never on board. It was effectively laid up while they decided what they were going to you know, do with it. Um, so it would depend on the wording and the circumstances. Arrangement before policy starts would be a better idea for when they accept it. If they do, yeah. My advice is always, and I think well, I'm not a placing broker, but uh, I know plenty of you are, who are. The advice is always if in doubt, tell them. All right. You can't get any more sound advice than that, really. Uh, uh, there's 20 million, uh, 20 million one that I've got in California that caught fire and they didn't tell the underwriters it was in the yard. It renewed four times. The clause was in each policy, and the covering letter from the broker said, if anything is unclear, call us at any time. And actually, um, the owner has, has admitted he knew it was in there. So we'll see what happens. Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, gen the general rule of thumb on marine insurance, and, and the Act says it, is as long as there's full disclosure between the parties, you can do whatever you like. You know, the boat won't, may only be worth a million, but if your underwriter is quite happy, and he knows that, and he's happy to insure it for three, and you're happy to pay the premium on three, there's no argument. You get three. Um, there was a case a couple of years ago uh, called the Galatea, where the boat was up for sale at the time that the insurance policy incepted. She was insured for 13. She was, in, she was listed at eight. And I think, and the, the evidence came out the same, that she was probably only worth about four. And the underwriter said, well, you know, if we'd have known that this was for sale, and if we'd have known that you were over-insuring it by a factor of you know, two, three, whatever, we'd never have touched it, and the judge agreed with them. There were other complicating factors as well. Um, the, if you ran the same case today, though, under the new Act, the outcome could be completely different. You, the underwriter has got so many more hurdles and has, has to prove materiality so much further. And it wasn't, you see, in this case, it was a fire, but there was never any suggestion that it was a scuttling. It was an accidental fire. So it's not as if he was deliberately out there trying to get 13 million under the insurance policy. He, he wasn't. And they think there is a good chance that if that same case in the same circumstances came up today, they'd probably still lose some of their other points because there are about half a dozen of them. But that one would be a good deal more difficult for the underwriters to get the same result because of the new act. It, it does. Uh, in, incompetent crew, or you know, yeah, incompetent crew renders a yacht or a ship unseaworthy, without a doubt, at law. Now, proving it, and as you're rightly saying, what's the standard? It's all right if you've got some international regulations to point to, or even national regulations to point to, but yeah, it, it vary, there are so many variables in it. Um, and it would be very, I mean, these, these law cases, of course, as you know, are incredibly expensive to run. I think on the Galatea, we spent somewhere in the region of three million, and that was just us. The other side obviously spent the same. Yeah, so that all developed into an argument then, yeah. trying to prove and disprove what it's seaworthy. 395 arguments, which is really the unseaworthiness, are notoriously difficult to, to run successfully. Notorious. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Question at the back. Well, you're here. That's I used to do a lot of narrow boat surveys. Oh. Um, narrow boats are generally confined to the English canals, which are Class D waters under the uh, definitions laid down by the MCA and others. Now, it's very common for some of these people to take their boats out onto the River Thames, which are class C waters, higher grade, more dangerous. Right. Would a warranty for a boat designed specially for the canals then be invalid if the guy takes it out onto the river? If, uh, if, it was, if there was a warranty in there that specified the canal that it must be an inland waterway, and then he went out and he was out on the tidal reaches of the Thames. And, and I've seen him do it and it's terrifying. Uh, uh, have you seen him? It's just going under Tower Bridge. Uh, after the chairman of the ship, and the old man called me up to the bridge. We had a narrow boat going across from England to France. It was going across our bounds. And he was in a very dodgy situation. <laughs> 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 I, bet, I bet he was. They're the same people who try and navigate using road maps, aren't they? Yeah, if, uh, if it was warranted that it had to stay within the inland waterways and, and, and canals, then yes, I think, uh, and there was a loss, while she said, particularly the tidal reaches of, of the Thames, there, there would be a problem. The, the trouble is that, I mean, we used to do the narrowboats as well, we, we don't anymore, I think one or two, is that customarily their navigation 
limits allow them to do that. And some of them do allow them even to go over to France. I think it's purely because nobody's really thought it through or seen it happening. Because yeah. it's, it's frightening stuff. Yeah. I'll with you on that one. Are you finding the brokers of putting some very strange clauses in the documents now about their own other commercial shipping? The clauses they're trying to put in with the new insurance act are almost catch alls to help the ship owner out. Yes. There's some really odd ones. So if, I'm not a surveyor, well, I am a surveyor, but I work for an insurance company. And uh, just find they're putting some things in now that if you use them to the clauses in contracts, read them again or check them if they're new since this happened. Because if, if they do slip by the underwriters, then there's going to be some really weird clauses in there, basically saying the only can do what he likes without telling the underwriter. Almost as bad as that, some of the wording wow. has been put in by the big brokers. Wow. No, I haven't seen any, but that's, that's good advice. It is in the commercial side, but whether it's happening in the yacht side, yes, I don't know. So Where it normally finds its way there sooner or later, yeah, probably sooner. Saying that they can, regardless of what happens in the future, anything written into this contract is applicable, even if there are changes made. There's some weird, outrageous uh, clauses being put in. Okay, we're taking them out. And they're not arguing the point, but they're trying to slip them in as, as renewals and things like that. It's, it's quite, quite shocking. Well, that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going on from what uh, Shanaji just said, we have got a case where a self generating uh, generic uh, policy was issued to a second yacht of a fleet, where uh, the, one of the clauses was the boat yacht should have a fixed fire fighting arrangement. Right. And then it so trans there was a total uh, a big fire and it was a uh, owners were claiming for a total loss and we went on board on behalf of some writers and we reported that there was no fixed fire fighting arrangement in the accommodation area. Right. Whereas it was there in the engine room area. So it just so transpired this boat as we dug backwards, it was never installed with a fixed fire fighting area. Whereas it was there in the policy. So there was an issue about it, and I think they had to have a compromise because the assured was too big. And the survey was not very cooperative. Because right. he reported the facts. Well, that's, that's a, a good, good, good example, because if, they, if you'd had those set of circumstances this time last month, and the fact that you hadn't got the firefighting equipment in there and you had a fire within that space, underwriters would just walk away from it. Now, they ultimately might win, but they're going to have to spend an awful lot more time you know, uh, and, and energy proving that, it, in fact, if there had been a firefighting system, they've got, to, they've got to show that it's actually causative, whereas this time last month they didn't have to. They just needed to show that you hadn't got one. And they would have been off risk. Well, in fact, they would have never been on risk because you, you would have been in breach from day one of the policy because the warranty's in there, so they would have no liability. Oh, this is behind the sky stuff, as you say, commercial uh, reasoning comes into it. But uh, they would never have been on risk because you were in permanent breach of the warranty. No liability for anything. So. Unfortunately, the underwriters had not imposed a survey warranty either. So if a surveyor had gone on board, he would have highlighted that there is a contravention with regard to the policy warranty. Yeah. And with uh, the yachts, I mean, for having a, a um, condition evaluation, a pre-risk survey done can be so disproportionate to the premium they're getting that uh, apart from on the very, very large yachts, which you know, may be a, a less in need of having condition evaluation surveys and probably are, um, there's, there's not enough premium in it to, uh, to make it worthwhile. It's that time, Nick. <laughs>